Yeah, it's, <clears throat> pardon me. I'm very sorry I can't be with you. It's really, uh, it, the hotel is fantastic. On the other hand, I would love to be at the event, which I've been listening to and watching, and have the chance to talk with with all of you. I mean, it just sounds so, so interesting. And this morning has been fantastic. And I uh, could, I'm so happy that uh, Tiana went uh, right before me because I 100% agree with every single word she said. And she said those words better than, far better than I would have. So, um, so my, I should also warn you that I am undoubtedly going to repeatedly forget to say next. I'm used to holding a clicker. So um, my topic is, um, uh, knowing without understanding, um, which is, it, it's to me, it's odd that this is a topic that needs to, to be discussed only because basically everything we know at least, without at least fully understanding and much we know without really understanding it <clears throat> at all. It's a common fact of life. So I'm going to give you a slightly uncommon example of this to start with. Next. Thank you. Um, uh, A-B testing, which I assume you're all familiar with, but just in case, you know, if you're advertising on the internet, you're very likely to go through A-B testing in which you put up the same version of an ad with minor, gener generally minor changes. The product image is on the left or on the right, or the background is gray or it's green. <clears throat> and you see if one of the versions gets 2% more clicks and you go with that one. It's very effective. It's extremely common. But we don't know why one version of the A-B testing works and another one doesn't. I've, did I have my, yeah, did I have my, yep. I will uncover my face. Sorry about that. Um, we don't know why and we generally don't care. There's no science of A-B, uh, no science of A-B testing because there's no need for one. It's more accurate and better just to try, try it out for each one. It's so easy and cheap to do. Yep, and so we don't care at all that we don't understand. And that's, I think, typical of much, if not most, of our our lives in a world, a world that is characterized by not just not just information overload and the incredibly fast pace of developments, which we've seen uh, illustrated several times already, just today and yesterday. The pace is picking up unbelievably. It's not just that. Uh, it's also that we are living in a in a chaotic environment, and, and not chaos in the sense of uh, rioting in the streets, although that also, next. Um, but chaos in the sense of chaos theory. Um, I am going to mention the butterfly effect uh, two, two talks in a row. Um, chaos theory, which began in the very early 70s, late 60s, um, has a couple of distinguishing characteristics, uh, one of which is that, next, it um, often finds nonlinear causation. That is a cause that has a predictable effect at a certain point under particular conditions, say the temperature is going up in the environment or whatever, um, has a very different effect, which is very unsettling. It makes cause and effect way more difficult than we thought it was back in the old mechanical universe days. Um, and, and is constantly, it can be very surprising and very uh, difficult to predict and sometimes to understand. Next, the next is indeed the butterfly effect, um, which seems completely implausible the standard example back from the early 70s is a butterfly landing on a flower uh, next, butterfly landing on a flower and causing a tornado in Texas or whatever, which seems utterly impossible, but it's it's true. I mean, not necessarily that one example, but those sorts of tiny events can trigger huge changes um, because as they, they there's a, there could be a cascade of effects and you go from a butterfly alighting to this increasing cascade that results in a major change. Um, and that happens because everything's connected and in, in hugely complex ways. Um, so uh, next. So we, we see actual butterfly effects all the time and we can recognize them all the time, but some, some of the time on the internet. Because one of the things about butterfly effects is that usually you can't see the origins. You know there's a tornado. You, could could not possibly trace it back to that uh, butterfly in Argentina, but on the internet we see this frequently. Um, in one particular guys, it's in viral videos. So I don't know if you remember from about five years ago there was um, the ice bucket challenge, 
um, began in the US, but did spread around the world. Uh, and this was the idea was that you would put you pour a bucket of ice water on your head and donate some money and challenge somebody else to do the same. Um, and as a result, they raised $150 million for uh, actually quite a good charity. I'm going to count $150 million as being sort of like a hurricane, except, you know, good, not bad. Um, and considering that it came from a butterfly that was, I would say, literally the stupidest thing you could imagine doing. Well, let's have people pour ice on their heads. Yet it took off. And who would have predicted it? Nevertheless, I think it is predictable that after this thing raised $150 million, CEOs around the world went to their marketing departments and said, I need one of those butterflies. Um, we need something, we need a viral video like that one. And the head of marketing, we hope, patiently tried to explain to the CEO that nobody knows what makes things go viral. You can't make something go viral. That that's an, in, that is an unfortunate truth from a marketing point of view, but it is it is the truth. In fact, it's not. This is not a solitary, weird subset of things. These these uh, butterflies. Oh, yep. Yeah, uh, next, please. Um, this sort of it, uh, inexplicability is our normal condition as human beings living on the planet. For example. Next. Could you have predicted precisely who would be in the crosswalk with you this morning as you went to work? Obviously not. You can't. There's too many factors involved. I mean, it's which train if you take, I don't know, the 30 people in the crosswalk. It depends on which train they took, which depends upon how when they woke up and how up late they were last night because their baby was crying or whatever. A change of massively unpredictable uh, effects uh, led to those people in the crosswalk. And let's say as you're in this crosswalk, the stranger behind you stumbles and knocks the papers out of your hand and, and you can't retrieve them. And now you, you're a little late for your appointment, the big meeting where you're going to present your proposal. And because of this, you get fired. That is, that's for you, that is a, uh, that is a hurricane or a tornado from this little tiny butterfly. But it could also, of course, be that you don't get fired, that because you don't have your notes anymore, you have to improvise and you come up with the idea that saves the world and gets you the Nobel Prize. And the, the hurricanes uh, and tornadoes, et cetera, do not always have to be negative. Nevertheless, it is, it is a fact of life that all of these things happen because everything is connecting, connected to everything all the time, everywhere, everything is connected, simultaneously affecting each other and being causes. It is not a possible world to figure out. Now we've reduced it to, when we can, to simple causes and simple effects because we can manage those, but that's not actually how, how the world works. Those are the exceptions. Knowing things without understanding them is the normal. Next. But AI is, next, thank you. AI uh, is um, able to work because it embraces this complexity, which it can do because it ignores everything that we know, everything. Um, this is true not only for ChatGPT, but for basically normal sorts of machine learning. When I say AI, I mean machine learning. Um, so in, <clears throat> in the old days of programming, which is still with us, of course, and will be forever probably, um, the way you program something is to figure out what are the factors that affect the outcomes that you're interested in and what is what's the relationship among those factors you see what the logic of the situation is but that requires a human being to know that so let's say you're going to instead you're going to train a machine learning system uh, for medical diagnoses and you're going to do it by feeding it a million health records um, you, you don't tell it what we already know. We know there's a correlation between smoking and lung cancer. We know there's a correlation between high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease, diseases. We know that, that's settled, but we don't tell the system that because we figure correctly 
that it will discover that for itself in the data. It's reflected in the data. And furthermore, it's going to discover relationships, very complex relationships, some that just as a relationship we're not going to be able to understand. Um, it's going to discover many, many, many more relationships, correlations, uh, some of which are pretty slight and minor, but some are, are stronger. But you put them together and you have some a, a system, a, st a statistical engine that is able to make better predictions based upon the data. And it does this because we refuse to tell it what we already know. We give it these numbers. We don't tell it what the numbers represent, which wouldn't mean anything to machine learning anyway, because it you know, doesn't know about anything. We don't tell, tell it what the numbers reflect and we don't tell them what the correlations are that we already know. We keep it ignorant in order for it to be able to be smarter than us. Next. So when explicability is possible, and it is to varying degrees, and it's we're getting more and more explicability over time, that's great. And there are applications where we don't probably don't want to use AI at all because it's inexplicable and for reasons often of social justice or just justice, we don't want to rely upon a system that we can't understand. Um, so yay for explicability. I'm not trying to say, oh, explicability, that's for losers. No, it's great when we can have it. Uh, and in particular, because of the instances, of AI's original sin of being biased. Um, as we just saw, a fantastic set of visual examples, it's amazing. And it is, it's tends towards, but we can ask, why does it tend towards bias? And it's because it's working off of data that's been gathered by humans. The essence, it's so important to remember, uh, as Tiana said throughout and at the end, these are ultimately machines created by humans for humans. It's so important. It's a whole set of important human decisions are, are made in the process of training machine learning. Um, so they're biased because humans are making the decisions about um, how to train the system or even what data we're going to count is significant enough to gather. And it is, is that data going to be equally representative of the world? And generally, 100% is not because the world sucks. You know. Um, yeah, I, uh, bosses can suck too, but the world overall in terms of equity is not, it's not the planet that the universe is going to show off as its example. Um, and even, even beyond that, we live in a society that is biased in, in many ways, not perniciously, but also in perniciously, uh, pernicious biases and racism, to take the most obvious example. And so the data uh, will reflect often will reflect those biases that are embedded in society. So we, there are many instances in which you just may not want to use AI because we can't explain it. But there are many cases in which we do want to use it. So in the next couple of years, if not already, oh, next. Ah, see, I forgot. And next after that, please. Um, in the next couple of years or even before, you go to your doctor for your annual checkup and the doctor's going to say, everything looks good. I do have to tell you, though, that our diagnostic AI says that there's a 75% chance that you're going to get type 2 diabetes type two diabetes in the next five years. And you're going to say, what? That's crazy. I, I don't eat carbohydrates. I eat no sugar. I exercise. There's, I have no history in my family. There's no genetic history of diabetes. Why would it say that? And the doctor's going to say, well, we don't know. And you're going to look a little angry and confused, and the doctor's going to, I guess, reassure you by saying, but through research and our own experience with this software, with this machine learning um, model, uh, when we have found that it, if it says 75% chance, and generally it's actually pretty accurate, so what do you want to do about it? And you'll have this conversation. I, I think in the next few years after that, we're not even going to have the conversation that will start if the system is proving itself out then we will treat it as if you're getting a blood test. Um, I get a blood test. The doctor tells me what it means. I don't know enough about anything to be able to evaluate that, but I, I trust it. And I think the same will happen with AI. It's already happening uh, on your on your phone, on your mobiles all the time. Um, I rely upon uh, routing software, Google Maps, I'll just say it, to get me places because I have no sense of physical location. Um, 
And it works really well. And I don't question, I don't ask, well, how did you know that? Because I wouldn't understand the answer anyway. And the real answer is, is it, it doesn't know anything. Um, in the sense in which, I'm sorry to keep referring back to Tiana, but that was such a great presentation, in the sense in which Tiana just discussed it. Um, I accept it. I expect you to, too, that you're not spending a lot of time arguing with your phone about the routing directions or its forecast of the weather, which is probabilistic, which is very handy, because that's, in fact, um, this, these systems are probabilistic in their, in their responses. Um, huh, OK. Um, so we hear in response to this inexplicability issue um, in increasing increasing volume and I think in, in anxiety, sentences like, but we don't know how it works, which is true. We don't know how it works. On the other hand, I don't think we're paying enough attention to the last two words in that sentence, which is it works. That's why we use it, because generally, it works, and we can ask, and we should ask, why does it work? It works because it, it finds these patterns in vast amounts of data, um, extremely complex patterns that it's able to put together to give us probabilistic results that work. Well, why, how can it find those patterns? Because those patterns are there. Why are those patterns there? Because everything affects everything else all the time across the entire universe, simultaneously, forever. That's our situation as humans in, in the universe. Everything affects everything. And these, these effects are simultaneous with the causes. There's no way of parsing that out in detail. We can do it in big chunks, of course. It's, it's our situation. So next. So here we're faced with black box AI, which means we can't understand how it's working, but we have a good sense that, yeah, it is working. There is a 75% chance you're gonna come down with type two diabetes, but we don't know why. That AI is a black box and it only works because, next, because the world is a black box, is the black box, the universe, the world is the black box that we live in, overwhelmingly complex and interrelated. I, I want to interject one one more uh, one other thing based upon Tiana's <laughs> wonderful presentation, which is we can also ask why. And she, I mean, she did such a wonderful job of explaining how it works, right down to text embedding, and visualize that really nicely, where we see the relationship of words, which is basically analyzed by chat AI, all of the chat uh, devices by looking at how physically close the words are to other words, what follows in a sentence. That's really rough, but I'll stick with it for now. Uh, and we can ask, why does ChatGPT work? Well, it works because our words, our inscribed words that it's learning from, uh, have certain patterns in them. Well, how did those patterns get in there? The patterns got in there because we like to talk and write in public, the stuff that it's being trained on, about things that matter to us that we're concerned about, that's interesting or scary, but that it, things that matter to us. It's that what matters is very culturally determinative, determined. Um, it was also very personal and individual. And so the uh, chat AI is able to note the patterns. The patterns are there because our ideas cluster around things that matter to us. So at the bottom of this is human mattering, the fact that we care about what happens to us and to others and to our world. Go back to the very first presentation this morning. So let me give you a quick, uh, going longer than I had hoped to, um, but I'm almost done. So I want to give you one quick example of what this might, the sort of thing this means for business. And let's talk about strategy, I hope in two minutes. Um, so strategy is actually a very new idea in our culture. It was only in the 18th century um, and then into the 19th century that it became something that we applied to war, the most chaotic of human events. How could there be general laws and principles that govern that? Um, well, under the influence of Newton and the Enlightenment, we decided, yeah, things are governed by general laws that are simple enough for us to understand. Well, that's really, what a coincidence. Um, and so let's try to find those laws and principles um, of war. And so war-based strategy emerged. Um, it was only in the 1960s that businesses decided that 
uh, they needed strategies also. And I, again, I don't want to argue too strongly against strategy, um, although I think that one of the big reasons that we use it is that it's, <coughs> pardon me, we find it comforting to think that we can master time over, say, 10 years or whatever. Um, but let's look at this from the point of view of a butterfly, um, because that's the, the thing that strategy can't deal with. But life contains more butterflies. Almost everything um, that happens to us is literally unpredictable, including who you're going to be in a crosswalk with. Um, so one of, the, one of the ways to start to address this is to try to find networks of people who are sensors. That is, they're very sensitive particular types of information because they're interested in it. And let's say that in one of these networks, public networks, because you're not going to invade anybody's privacy, of course, uh, you find that a person who, for whatever reason, follows closely what's going on in Chinese chip uh, industry and notices that a supplier to a supplier to a supplier has started stocking up on a particular mineral. And so she asks her little network of friends and people, you know, it's an interest group, an informal interest group. I just noticed this. What do you make of it? Why are they stockpiling this mineral? And they have a conversation and they engage in the sort of collaborative sense making that the Internet at its best does or does at its best. If you can um, find those discussions, if you can enable them, if you can encourage them, if you can never subvert the trust of the people who are engaging in those conversations, you are now finding butterflies. That's what those people do. That's what people on the internet do all the time. All the time, people will notice something that looks anomalous and try to make sense of it. Those are the butterflies that could subvert your business or enable you to push it forward um, dramatically. So, um, next. So I, I'm gonna give you two reasons why it's a good idea to embrace this and to embrace the, this being AI and to and the inexplicability of AIs to embrace it fully, even though it hurts our species pride that we can't understand everything or possibly anything that happens. It's good to do this for two basic reasons. One is it works next. One is that it works and thus can bring you success, uh, maybe unexpected success or steal, steer you away from from failure. Um, the second, I think, is at least as important, next, which it's the truth. It's the truth about the world we live in. It, it is incredibly complex, um, largely beyond our control, uh, largely beyond our prediction. AI is giving us a way to succeed because AI embraces that chaotic complexity. Um, and I, not only do I think that this is a good lesson for business, I think it's an important corrective for human pride. Thank you.